Up next, Gordon and I take a look at the Sony RX100 Mark V on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Hello, this is Doug Kay. I'm here once again with Mr. Camera Labs, Gordon Lang. Good morning, Gordon. Good afternoon. How are you? Good morning, good afternoon to you, Doug. I'm very well, and I'm pleased to say, hopefully people, regular listeners or viewers may notice an upgrade in my sound quality. So far, the comments we've been getting over at YouTube and on the podcast are that people are enjoying it, which is great. We like that. But everyone was saying Doug's audio is such good quality and Gordon's is rubbish. So what can we do to upgrade it? So I suggested a few coffee donations off the cuff, and they came in. So this is for all the people who uh, were generous enough to donate. I've plugged in my Zoom H2N USB mic, which hopefully sounds better and i'm going to be looking into some road podcasting mics as well for future shows so hopefully my audio quality will be far superior to earlier episodes but tell us what you think please let us know yeah let us know give us uh, send us comments feedback anything you can we're always looking for your opinions no matter what they may be hey gordon listen i don't i can't think of another time in the history of these reviews we've ever had a fifth generation camera can you? No, there's obviously been the Canon EOS 5D Mark IV, uh, but I don't think there's been a Mark V of anything. No. And I, I think you once expressed a theory, one of us did, either you or I, that, that if a camera is successful, they come out version 2, version 3, version 4. If a camera is not successful, they rename it for the next version. I like that theory. It's not my theory, but I think it's, it sounds quite feasible. So the, the implication is that the Sony RX100 has been such a successful line that we now have a version 5 because they want to capitalize on that name. Oh, you happen to have one right there. How convenient. I know. Here it is, the Mark V. I mean, to just kind of go back to basics here about what kind of camera this is, it's obviously a pocket camera pocketish camera it's a compact it falls into a category that manufacturers are beginning to refer to as a premium compact and by that they generally mean it has a kind of larger sensor than you'd normally get in a mobile phone or in a typical point and shoot or super zoom camera in the case of the rx100 series it is it is a one inch type sensor which falls roughly in surface area between like i say a smartphone sensor and the kind of sensor that you'd get in a typical interchangeable lens camera Camera. Bigger sensor means that you get lower noise in uh, low light, more saturated colors, better dynamic range, more opportunities to push and pull your raw files if you're into that sort of thing. And generally, you know, much better quality. Also, the opportunity, as long as the lens uh, is the right kind of lens, to achieve a shallower depth of field. So Sony were, I think, the first to come up with this concept on the original RX100 Mark One, and it was so successful that they did a Mark II, three, four, and now the five, but they're also now joined by Panasonic has got several models. Um, Canon has got a number of models with one inch sensors. Nikon tried to launch obviously the DL about a year ago, had some problems with that, but hopefully we'll be seeing that sometime in the future. So there's a lot of models in this premium compact market and they're, they're really, really nice. And premium is another point of premium is they're not inexpensive. Uh, compared, especially this one, I'm going to answer the question that that everyone's waiting for, which is, what does this camera cost? This camera is roughly a thousand dollars U.S. Although I was just checking B and H, and they are already offering a one hundred dollar gift card as part of their package. So uh, that actually brings it down to the equivalent of $898 US. And of course, at the time you're watching and listening to this, who knows what the pricing will be? Check it out. But it's a, it's a premium compact camera, but it is um, uh, the prices are already coming down. So do you also happen to have, Doug, the prices of the previous version, the Mark IV, maybe the Mark III? Yeah, what's interesting is at this very moment, the Mark IV is $898 US, which means it's the same price when you factor in the gift card. So why wouldn't you buy the five for the same price? And the Mark III is $698. So it's roughly $200 less than the discounted price or $300 less than the full price. And in fact, you can find an open box for only $5.98. So for $600, you could buy one that is supposedly brand new and warranted, uh, but the box has been opened and the camera returned. So 
there are obviously also many competitors to this. I think two, two of the key models, although they, neither of them include a built-in viewfinder, but we'll cover those features in, in, the, in the show. First of all, the Canon PowerShot G7X Mark II. Do you have a price for that? Yeah, that's just a little under $700. So we're talking about uh, a camera that is... Um, Let's see, what does that come out to be? 700 so it's, you know, $200 cheaper, right? Am I doing my arithmetic right? I have to have more coffee. And the Panasonic Lumix LX10, LX15? Yeah, the LX10, LX15 is also the same, $697, so just under $700 US. So, so we're looking at something that those two cameras are $200 less expensive than these uh, when you factor in the current pricing. Right, so bear all of those prices in mind as we discuss the various features. The Sony's, the Mark IV and the Mark V are at the upper end of all of those, comfortably at the upper end. So you've got to, they do have some very powerful features, but they are fairly esoteric features, which I think will have reasonably limited appeal. Some people who are into it will absolutely love it and will not believe that they're getting those capabilities. But a lot of other people will think, well... It sounds nice, but am I actually going to use that? So that's what we're going to talk about. So I think maybe the first thing to discuss, Doug, is what the Mark V actually has in common with the Mark IV and indeed the Mark III before it. And just looking at the camera physically, they all share essentially the same body. Sony's gone for a very flat fronted camera with no real grip to speak of. To me, it's actually of its rivals, of, of, the, of this peer group, the hardest to hold. Um, most comfortably. It's got a very smooth front that's completely flat. There's no grip on the front. There's only just a very slightest bulge on the rear for your thumb to push up against. And, you know, that's a kind of style thing more than anything else because uh, the Lumix LX10, LX15 manages to squeeze on quite a nice textured rubber grip. As does, Sorry, no, it doesn't. It's got a ridge along the front. The G7X Mark II has got the textured grip. And, both, you know, it's not like one sticks out of your pocket more than the other. So I think Sony can't really use size as an excuse there or wait. It is just purely a style thing. But I'll get out of the way straight away that you can buy an accessory grip from Sony. That's only about 10 or $15. And that, that makes it much more comfortable. So I'm not going to dwell on that. It's more to say that the general design of this camera is the same as the Mark IV and the Mark III. And like those models, you can compose with a screen that can tilt all the way up to face the subject, which is great for selfies or if you're into video uh, blogging. It can also angle down by about 45 degrees, which is great if you're filming at high angles or over the heads of crowds. The thing that really differentiates the Sony from its rivals, and I say the Sony because it applies to the Mark III, the Mark IV, and the Mark V, is the pop-up electronic viewfinder. If you flick a switch on the side of the body, a little viewfinder pops open there. You need to you need to do something else before you can use it. You need to pull it out towards your eye. But then you've got this lovely little electronic viewfinder. Now, on the Mark IV, they upgraded the resolution uh, it's to an XGA OLED panel. And that's what the Mark V inherits. But the Mark III still has a pop-up viewfinder that works in the same way. And really, it's it's amazing. Because when you fold it back down again, it just disappears. And you think, blimey, where did Sony put that? You know, I mean, that, this is a company that is a master of miniaturization, and that is a perfect example of that. So same screen, same viewfinder, same body. Um, One thing I want to say about that, I've owned the Mark III and I now own the Mark IV. On the Mark III, unless they've corrected this in a firmware upgrade, and I wouldn't know because I no longer have the camera, it used to be that when you open the viewfinder, as it does here, uh, that automatically extends the lens. And when you closed it, it automatically retracted the lens. That was annoying because you might want to start with the viewfinder and then work with the LCD. In the four and the five, it doesn't do that. Uh, you have the option of whether or not closing that also retracts the lens. And that's a, a very small, but a significant improvement for me anyway. Yeah, definitely. That was well pointed out. The Mark III didn't let you do that. Everyone complained about it. So they put it in as an option on the Mark IV and that option is still there on the Mark V. The other major thing that these cameras have in common, these three cameras, is this lens that was introduced with the Mark III. It is a 24 to 70 millimeter equivalent, f1.8 to 2.8 that can focus to five centimeters 
when it's at its wide angle setting. So that's the same lens now on three generations. Now I'm gonna suggest later on in the video that maybe Sony should be looking to update that because while it is a useful general purpose range, it's now outgunned in some respects by its rivals. Oh, I'm just gonna say it now, Doug. The Canon G7X Mark II zooms longer, so it's more flattering for portraits. And the Lumix LX10 or LX15 not only focuses closer at three centimeters, but it also has nicer rendering. So if you're into macro photography, I find the Panasonic preferable. So the Sony kind of sits in the middle and, and has nothing remarkable about its lens. It's, it's a fine lens, but it's beaten by some of its rivals. So I think it could do with something to differentiate it. Um, before I move on, I should also say about the body that when Sony announced the Mark V, they also announced a new underwater housing that works for all the RX100 series. So if you're into underwater shooting, um, it lets you go. It lets you go pretty deep. I think it's about 40 meters. I've got the definite figure in my review, but it's not as much as the housings that cost a thousand dollars, but it's considerably cheaper than that. So it kind of takes you to that halfway point. And when you look at the figures, you think, well, you know, that's still pretty deep. You can you can still go fairly, fairly deep with this Sony housing. So it's nice to see them do an accessory that also works with all of those. Would you ever dive with one of these? It's a very popular camera for diving. Uh, I used to do a lot of underwater photography. Uh, I don't know if I'd use this or not because so if you get to 40 meters, um, for, first of all, that's a very deep dive. Let's say even 30 meters is a deep dive, but you're going to need uh, a more sophisticated strobe system because it's at 30 meters, not only is it dark, but it's also there's no red light down there. So um, I'm not, I, I, this is even in a housing, this is a shallow water camera. Okay, so inherited, there's a lot of stuff that's inherited from the Mark III and the Mark IV. Some features that are inherited from the Mark IV that it shares in common. It shoots 4K video with a 1.1 times crop. It's not the full sensor width. It's a 1.1 times crop for 4K. Uh, thanks to the stack sensor design, it can support incredibly quick um, shooting for video. It just has these high frame rate modes that shoot at 240, 480, or 960 frames per second. So that lets you slow down your footage by up to 40 times if you're conforming to 24 frames per second, which is incredible. Those quality modes may be the same. Those frame rates may be the same as the Mark IV, but in a new feature I'll tell you about in a minute, you can actually record for longer. Um, so those are the things that it shares with the Mark IV. So now you're going, yeah, stop telling me what it shares with the old models. What is new on the Mark V? Why would I be paying a retail price of a grand for this in US dollars? And it's really two main features. The first is that Sony have finally uh, embedded phase detect AF points on the sensor. Now they're doing that to most of their sensors now, so it's no real surprise, although perhaps the biggest surprise is how long it's taken them to do it. Now the Nikon One system, that sensor has embedded phase detect points, so they have existed on a one inch class sensor in the past, but I believe this is the first time that anyone's done it on a fixed lens compact like the RX100 series. Of course, there's Nikon's DL, which uses this Nikon One sensor but it's not for sale yet so as far as i can remember the rx100 mark 5 gains this unique advantage it is the first fixed lens one inch class compact with embedded face detect af and of course the benefit that that gives you is more confident focusing in a continuous environment so when it's either tracking action for still photography or pulling focus you get a more confident uh, performance. We'll talk about that more in a second. The other big feature is that it has Sony's front side LSI, the large scale integrated circuit, which of course it's made quite a few of. So it's now in the A99 Mark II, the A6500, and it's now in the RX100 Mark V. I expect to find it in pretty much every high end Sony camera going forward. And this absolutely chews through data, partly because that's what it does, and also partly because of where it is in the system. It can access a lot of data coming off that sensor before it, it goes onto a thinner bus. And what that allows it to do is shoot even faster than before. So the old model was no slouch. It shot at 16 frames per second, but now it can this one can shoot at 24 frames per second and it can chew through that data so fast. Sony quotes a buffer of 150 JPEGs. And I'll tell you what I managed to get with it later on in the video, but it was actually better than that. So they're the two main features that it has over the Mark IV, the embedded phase detect AF and the, um, the, the faster processing, which allows faster burst shooting, extended HFR recording times, and just this incredible buffer that lets you keep shooting for ages. Also, uh, reading your detailed review, I've got some, uh, a couple of things you pointed out. I didn't realize that the Mark IV was pretty good in terms of rolling shutter. 
which is something that you may want to talk about in a video, but um, they call it the anti-distortion shutter. Is that right? Yeah, it's not like the anti-reality field or anything like that. Uh, well, as, as you know, it's all very well saying, oh, you know, it shoots at 24 frames per second with an electronic shutter. With the mechanical shutter, it slows down to 10 frames per second, which is still fast, uh, but 24 requires an electronic shutter. And if you've shot with electronic shutters before, you might be thinking, well, you know, that's fine. But if you're following action, if you're panning from left to right to follow action or something like that, electronic shutters, because of the way they read the data off the sensor, it can't get the data off fast enough in a lot of cameras. And that means that by the time it's actually reading the sensor, uh, as it's going to say from top to bottom, the subject's actually moved or the background's moved. So it actually skews the picture or the subject, which doesn't look good at all. If you're looking at, say, lampposts or straight posts, they'll actually be leaning. Buildings will be leaning to the side. People will be distorted. So electronic shutters have rightly got a bad uh, reputation for that. But the manufacturers are getting better at getting the data readout of these sensors faster and faster. And with the Mark IV, the stacked sensor design that certainly developed allowed them to get the data off it so fast that not only did it offer one over 32,000th of a second electronic shutter speed, which means coupled with the built-in three-stop ND filter in the lens means you can shoot under basically, you could be next to the sun and it wouldn't, wouldn't be too bright. Um, but it also means that they've managed to virtually eliminate electronic shutter. And I, I, with the Mark IV and with the Mark V, I really did a lot of torture tests with it. I was swinging it back and forth really fast, side to side, as fast as I could. And you could barely, barely see any uh, electronic shutter artifacts occasionally. You could if you were really looking, but nothing that I'd be concerned about. So this anti-distortion electronic shutter facility that was introduced on the Mark IV is inherited on the Mark V, which means when they say it can shoot at 24 frames per second, it's usable. You know, it's usable even when something's shooting past. And that also improves things for the video. Yeah, one, another thing in a similar vein that we've been talking about for the last few months with these cameras is the viewfinder lag. Did you get a chance with this camera to evaluate the viewfinder lag in terms of tracking some fast moving subjects? And maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe explain to people what that is once again, because it's, it's something that people don't usually think about. Okay, well, if you go back to, say, DSLRs or SLRs with optical viewfinders, when um, when it takes a picture, the mirror flips up so that the sensor or the film can be exposed. But then if that mirror flips back down again, the light can still go through the lens, hit that mirror, go through another mirror or, or prism and out to your eye. And this happens at the speed of light. While that mirror is down, the only delay you have is the speed of light, which is pretty quick uh, in, in this sort of distance. You know, it's effectively instantaneous. So you get instant feedback. And this is why sports photographers, action photographers like shooting with DSLRs traditionally, because there's no lag. Of course, there's blackout when the mirror is flipped up. It's not going to see anything. But as soon as that mirror is down, even just for a split second, you're seeing what's happening right now with electronic composition. Um, as soon as the sensor has taken its picture, it has to read the data off that sensor again, process it into a picture and, dis and send it to an electronic screen or viewfinder. Now, they're getting much, much faster at this, but there is still a small delay. And this is traditionally why electronic uh, composition cameras, mirrorless cameras, for example, or point and shoots like these, typically have some sort of lag uh, when you're doing continuous shooting. What you see isn't what hap what's happening now, but typically what happened just a split second ago. And even if it's a split second, it's amazing how that can kind of carry on with itself. And you, if you're following something, you'll see it suddenly kind of either going too fast or too slow. And, you, and you're trying to compensate, but you're compensating for something that's not happening now. And that's for something moving predictably. If you're following a tennis or a football player or a kid or a dog or something, and it suddenly changes direction it becomes even harder. But with these cameras, Sony is getting much better at providing better feedback. And on the Mark IV, there was already very, very little lag. And on the Mark V, especially when you're shooting at 24 frames per second, I mean, that's actually a video frame rate. So what you're seeing through the viewfinder, even if it's playing it back, it's it's effectively in real time and there's, there's minimal blackout. So you have no problem at all following action with this camera. And that, that's one of its key benefits. You know, if you're into, you know, shooting really demanding action, the ability to do that at 24 frames per second with minimal distortion for massive bursts, even in raw and, you know, um, no blackout to really speak of, then that, that's, that's fantastic. You know, that's really good. All right. So let's go back and talk a little more about the autofocus. You mentioned the fact that 
this camera has the 315 phase detect auto, autofocus points, which is great. Um, when do those come into play? In what modes does the camera use those? Okay, so uh, as, as you said, it has 315 embedded face detect AF points. They cover 65% of the frame. That doesn't sound like very much, but when you overlay the actual area on the screen, because there's like a preview mode where you can say, just show me the face detect coverage, it's actually most of the frame. You know, it's only like a thin board around the edges. So it's effectively covering a very large proportion of the frame. Like most Sony cameras that have both... Uh, that that have embedded face detect AF, it actually uses both face detect and contrast detect when you've got it set to single AFS, single autofocus. It kind of uses the face detect to know which direction to focus in and get most of the way there. And then there's a little wobble at the end for the contrast to get it absolutely spot on. So you will see a little hunt at the end, but it's really, really, really quick. Um, if you set them to continuous autofocus, then it becomes face detect only. So long as it falls within that phase detect area so when it's set to afc continuous autofocus it's using the phase detect system um and there are lots of different af areas that you can choose from there's um there's flexible spot so you can move it around and change the size there's expand flexible spot which is one of my favorites that actually uh, lets you position the af area but also consider those around it's like a mini zone unfortunately there isn't an actual zone mode for some reason they don't put that on the rx100 series and um, there's wide areas as well and there's all the lock-on af modes that can apply to those two so in those modes you kind of start off with the af area in a fixed position you position it over your target, half press the shutter release, and then it moves off with the target. Now, in my test, I tested this with all manner of things, cyclists approaching, dogs, kids running, seagulls, uh, loads of action sports. And like most live view cameras, so this includes mirrorless cameras as well. You're dealing with like a little box, right? This is your AF areas, a little box. And so long as that, the, that box is completely covered by the subject. So if the subject is bigger, if you imagine a person, let's say that box is the size of their face or the size of their torso, then you should have no problem at all. But it is amazing how the subjects don't have to be too far away for them to actually have some space around them within this box. Even though this box is teeny tiny, the, you know, someone's torso could only feel half of it. And in that scenario, you're asking the camera to work out what inside this box you want it to focus on. Now, it should focus on the thing that's closest, but it might not be that precise. And by the time that subject gets closer and you're trying to say, look, I wanted you to focus on the face, not the chest, then you may have lost that chance. So typically what I found, like, say, Sony's A6500, and like any mirrorless camera, you really need to wait until the subject is sufficiently close for you to make sure that that AF area is completely covered by the subject. Then you half press the shutter and start shooting. The only difficulty with that on the RX100 Mark V is that the longest focal length is only 70 millimeter equivalent. So if you're looking at, say, a cyclist or a dog or a kid coming towards you, they're going to be pretty close, pretty close, especially if they're going quick before they're sufficiently big for the system to lock on. So I found it a bit hit and miss, definitely better than any one inch premium compact i've tested so far but where it seemed to be much more confident was when you've got it zoomed wide and you're shooting subjects that enter into the frame at close range very quickly imagine you're photographing um uh, bmx bikes for example and you're stood at the the edge of like a, a half pipe or you know a, a bowl and literally they come up right in front of you so they're big right in front of you most cameras if you then half press the shutter release to auto focus they'd go zip 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 and of course it's gone the bike is gone at that point but i found with the rx100 mark 5 it was it was absolutely fine as soon as it entered the frame half press the shutter grabbed the picture it was in focus and better still got 24 of them in one second and when the subject's that close and moving that fast, even at 24 frames per second, you're getting quite different looking pictures each time. It's not like you've got 24 pictures that look identical. And I've got an example of that in my review at CameraLabs.com, again, with the bike at close range. And also the bike coming towards you where it's less important. So all in all, don't expect it to perform like, say, a top of the range a mirrorless camera like an A6500, probably mostly because of the focal length of the lens more than anything else. But do expect it to perform better than a typical premium compact. 
And in fact, at this point, I'd like to show you a, a couple of videos because Phase Detect AF isn't just for still photography, it's also for videos. So here's a video I've filmed um, with the camera set to 24mm f1.8 and I'm, I'm panning between uh, a, a little plant in the foreground. This is the coffee shop I do a lot of my work in in Brighton and the background just moving the camera up and down and you can see it's refocusing pretty confidently. This is at 24mm 1.8. Now, if I zoom it into 70 millimeter f2.8, which is uh, what you're seeing in this next clip, you'll see that it's become a little bit more hesitant. It kind of waits a bit and goes, you sure that's what you want? OK, I'll do it. Now, you can change that response in the menus. But the important thing to notice in both of these clips is that the camera, when it does refocus, it doesn't hunt at the end. It kind of goes, it refocuses and it stops and then it refocuses and it stops again. And it works with face detection. Here's a video of uh, me walking towards the camera. This is at 70 millimeter f2.8. And in fact, don't look at me, look at the background going out of focus. You can see that it doesn't breathe back and forth. It kind of consistently goes in the correct direction. And when I dodge out the way and come back again, you can see it refocus and it stops when you want it to. This is, now the other cameras are very good at doing this, but this is better. So for me, the Face Detect AF really comes into its own for video more than anything else. Yeah, that's, that's the main thing about Face Detect that's so important is that uh, the Face Detect sensors can tell the focusing system uh, where to focus um, and exactly how far to change the focus. They never have to hunt. And when you, that's one of the ways you tell Phase Detect from contrast focusing is in contrast focus. It's going to, no matter where it goes, it's always going to have to overshoot a little bit and it's always going to have to back up a little bit. Um, now, of course, when you're doing these videos, you can just refocusing by touching the screen, can't you, Gordon? <laughs> if only you could, Doug, if only you could. This, this kind of autofocus technology is crying out for a touch screen. So you could, uh, you saw in that coffee cup example, I had to move the camera effectively to move the AF point. Would it be nice to have just tapped the screen? Well, unfortunately, Sony has still resisted once again to fit a touch screen on the RX100 series and the RX10 still doesn't have one. Both of these cameras are begging for it, crying out for it. It would be so good. And I actually was testing the Lumix LX10, LX15 at the same time as the Mark V. And in the same way, when I was testing the Mark IV against the Canon G7X, um, I was just struck by how much easier it is to reposition an AF area or pull focus with the, the Canon and the Sony, simply because they have a touch screen. And Sony, of course, also has its uh, apps that you need to connect to the internet to update or install. So at some point, you're going to have to enter passwords into these cameras. You're going to have to enter... Um, security passwords for uh, Wi-Fi as well as for your Play Memories account. And as you're laboriously clicking your way through a little alphabet keyboard on the screen, you're thinking, why, Sony, why? Why didn't you put a touch screen on this? So things are changing slowly at Sony. They have got one on the A6500, although as we discussed in our review of that, they don't use it as much as they should, but at least it's there. Once the hardware's there, you can improve the software with firmware updates. You know, we just want the hardware to be there. So please, Sony, put a touch screen on the RX100 Mark VI. And, and it's these sort of things, you know, if, you, if this was a $500 camera, you would go... Well, you know, it's annoying, but but it's a thousand dollar camera, mm -hmm. and there's it's six seven hundred dollar rivals have it, so it's you know it kind of. And I'm going to mention a few of these annoyances throughout the review, and there's these little things where you think, oh, you know what, it's less forgivable at this price. Yeah, you know this this camera is I forget the exact price, but we're talking about roughly the same price as the Alpha sixty three hundred. Um, which is a you know an APS-C camera. It's, it's a different class of camera, but an extremely good one. Um, one thing that I learned from your written review that they've added here, a little feature that I love in these cameras, uh, also inherited from the Alpha series, is eye focus. Uh, the ability to actually tell the camera that you want to emphasize faces, but even eyes. Uh, how did that work for, for you on this camera? Well, it's the same software that powers it in the other cameras. So it's slightly in typical Sony style, slightly convoluted how you kind of activate it separately to face detection. But once it's going and you've assigned it to a button and you press the button, basically you get a little a little AF areas positioned over the eye and it and it'll follow it. And the best thing about it is that a lot of cameras with 
eye detection only support it in the contrast detect AF mode. What that means is that if the person is doing this, moving back and forward, they're swaying, you know, as kids or impatient subjects often do, then it's not going to effectively track them. But because Sony's managed to deploy eye detection with the phase detect AF system, it can track it much better. So yeah, that's a, that's a really nice feature. But it's interesting you should mention the um, A6300 at the same price because the one thing, for example, that the RX100 Mark IV and V can do that it can't do is shoot at these ridiculously high uh, video frame rates. This was introduced with the Mark IV. It's called high, high frame rate video. It shoots at 240, 480 or 960 frames per second at progressively lower resolutions and lower quality. But the 240 frames per second mode is very close to 1080p in quality. It looks really good. And in fact, while I'm talking about this, we'll play a video, a compilation that I filmed with the, uh, the Mark V showing some of those different slow motion modes in action. Now, the thing that's changed, or actually I'll talk about the Mark IV first. You had two options. You could record two seconds worth of video in high quality or four seconds worth at a kind of lower quality. That's for each of those frame rates. You could choose between like a quality priority or a time priority. Now, four seconds is actually, once you slow it down, that's an awful lot of frames to deal with. So four seconds is enough normally to capture the decisive moment, two less so. So it's tricky to get it with two seconds, especially, I mean, it might have allowed you to do this kind of pre-capture thing, but then maybe something interesting would happen afterwards or, or, or further before. So if only they, they offered like a four second recording time with a quality mode, and now they do. The faster processing of the Mark V has effectively doubled those HFR recording times. So instead of two and four seconds, it's now four and eight. I'd still avoid the time mode. You don't really need eight seconds because it's going to generate this file that will last about five minutes and it writes it to the card in real time. So, I mean, to give you an example, if you're shooting four seconds worth at 240 frames per second, it'll take, it'll create a, a video file that runs for about 45 seconds and it'll take about 45 seconds to write it to the card. And if you take that then to 960 frames per second, you record four seconds of 960 frames per second, that clip will last for two minutes and 40 seconds and it'll take two minutes and 40 seconds to write to the card. And you'll see it, the same as the Mark IV, it plays it as it's recording it. So you can watch it and if you've clearly missed it, it doesn't force you to go through the whole thing. You can actually press a button and abort it and say, forget it. I want to try again. I'm not going to sit around for two minutes waiting for it to record something that looks rubbish. I'll do it again. But what would be really nice, what I found quite a few times, is I'd actually got the best bit just at the beginning. But the, and I thought, well, I want to keep that. But then you've got to wait for it to do the whole thing, which, again, could take two and a half minutes to finish. I'd really like the Mark V to have been able to truncate that and say, right, I've got the bit I want, stop recording it, I've got what I want, that's fine. So that would be a feature I'd like to see in the future. But this HFR, you know, I mean, it's pretty specialist stuff, but if you're into slow motion video, there's very little else that can... And look at the size of the camera. You know, I mean, you're shooting at 960 frames per second with something this size. And professional filmmakers will say, look, you know, I used to have to use a Phantom for that, and that's a massive camera that costs a fortune. So the fact that you can do it with this is, is amazing. But the question, again, I would ask all the viewers and listeners is who is going to be using that? You know, it's quite a specialist feature, but we can talk a bit more about that. Because I also now, now want to talk about burst shooting, unless you wanted to yeah. no, no, interject go ahead. on HFR. Okay, no, so, no, I'm just, please go ahead. You're, you're following my notes beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if we talked about it beforehand. We didn't talk about it before. We, we didn't. Um... So, as you know, it shoots at 24 frames per second with the electronic shutter. And thanks to this front side LSI processor, it can burn through that data. Now, they may or may not have also increased the buffer size, the, the amount of buffer memory. But effectively, the buffer is increased because it works through this data faster. Sony quotes 150 JPEGs at 24 frames per second. I managed 160 at 24 frames per second or 195 at 10 frames per second. Even switching it to RAW, I managed over 70 frames in a burst at 24 frames per second. Just think about that. You're shooting 70 RAW files at 24 frames per second. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And if you keep saying 24 frames per second enough times, you'll, you'll convince yourself that, in fact, this is video. You're capturing video at 20 megapixels. So this isn't 4K, it's something else K. I'm not going to do the math. You do the math for me. It's, it's capturing this ultra high resolution file, admittedly only for a few seconds, but even in RAW, if you like. So, I mean, that's amazing. And I've seen some filmmakers actually 
uh, capture still frames on the RX100 Mark V and stick them together into a video. There's a few examples of that you might want to find. The quality looks a little bit funny on it, but it does kind of indicate this convergence where we're heading to in the future where video is becoming good enough for stills and stills is becoming good enough for video and and the two are kind of meeting and melding more than ever before but the fact is if you want to shoot massive bursts extremely quickly no other camera is is going to do it you know this 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 has got in, incredible i mean the mark 4 had incredibly fast burst shooting as well but it's it's peanuts compared to the mark 5 but again i ask you dear reader listener viewer do you need it but we'll come back to that. Well, I mean, it's, uh, if you think about it, so you can actually shoot 150 JPEGs at 24 frames a second, which is, and it's a much higher resolution than 4K video. So you have the option now of shooting six seconds in a burst that you can then do what we call pan and scan. So you can essentially select your 4K rectangle anywhere out of that 20 megapixel image. So they're actually, although you end up with a lot of data, there's actually a use case for doing that. Uh, you mm. know, anybody who's ever shot 4K and decided what they really want is a, a 1080 image uh, knows that they can obviously uh, just select a portion of the image for their final output. So I guess there, someone's going to figure out how to use that, I think. I wanted to talk about 4K video as well, because this is something that was introduced on the Mark IV. So the Mark V inherits it, same 1.1 times crop, same 24, 25 or 30 frames per second. It's very good quality. It's really nice. Um, Panasonic, of course, offers 4K on the LX10, LX15, albeit with a tighter crop. But there are, and, and Sony, of course, offers it with loads of features. You've got focus peaking, you've got S-Log2 if you want flat, um, flat output for grading later. But there's one key difference between the Sony and the Panasonic, and that is that regards the length of the clips. Now, um, on the Mark IV and on the Mark V, you can only record five minutes of 4K before the camera stops. And it does this to avoid overheating. Now, you can start recording another, another clip straight away, but it's only five minutes in length. Now, I found after recording four of those in a row, a little temperature icon came on. And then after a couple more clips, it actually shut itself down. It said, no, look, I'm too hot now. I, I don't want to continue. So that was after about half an hour's worth across six clips. But to the touch, I mean, uh, maybe they're being a bit... Um, pessimistic about it you know it didn't it felt warm it didn't feel hot to me but anyway the camera didn't want to go on any further i had to wait a few minutes for it to cool down sufficiently to let me record again and subsequent clips got shorter and shorter and shorter i eventually drained the battery after about an hour's worth of footage but you know we were talking about 30 second clips at a time so not really usable so really only about half an hour's worth of usable clip lengths but still only five minutes per clip now panasonic on the lx10 or lx15 can record 4k for 15 minute clips and this is a one inch comp compact camera that's the same size as the sony um and i managed to record um i think it was like four about four of them in a row so about an hour's worth and it didn't complain of overheating it did feel hot at the end but it recorded them all so in terms of longer clip length and less chance of it stopping due to overheating the panasonic was actually preferable in that regard so they may both say they do 4k but there's different things to look out for and, and another thing i wanted to mention about the sony is they've got they've got this great feature you know how panasonic let you do 4k photo and extract eight megapixel stills well you can do that with the sony as well and in fact it's not as slick and it doesn't have the post focus thing but there is a little menu you'll find in playback if you're playing back a video file this menu appears where you can extract a photo uh, from that at whatever the video resolution is but the sony's for a long time have also allowed you to capture 17 megapixel stills while it's recording video why isn't it 20? It's because it's 16 by 9, so it's cropped the top and the bottom. But still, it's, you know, the full sensor width resolution. 17 megapixels still is very nice. And I've done that a lot when I've been, um, say, filming uh, happy birthday songs to people before they blow out the candles. You know, you get decent stills and video at the same time. They're just looking into one camera. Now, Sony still say this is a feature on the Mark V, and it's easy to just move on. But, of course, I never move on. I want to try it out. Works fine in 1080p, doesn't work in 4K. And it doesn't work in 1080 on the high frame rates because it'll also do 1080 at 100 or 120p. It would appear to be a bitrate issue, not a resolution issue, a bitrate issue. If the video format is below 50 megabits, 
it does let you record the stills while you're filming. If the video bitrate is higher, and this, and this camera offers 60 and 100 megabits per second, for example, for 4K, uh, then it, it, that option is greyed out, which is a shame. I'd really like, especially as this is surely something that requires a fast sensor and a fast processor. This is surely something that Sony is good at. So I'm a bit annoyed that it doesn't let you do that. I think maybe, because I think that it's offered on some of the really high-end Pro Sony cameras, I think it might be an SD memory card issue because they still don't support UHS Class 2 on this. It's UHS, sorry, UHS 1, not UHS 2, right? So I think maybe they need to upgrade the interface for the SD memory card to support that. But that's a shame because that's a nice feature. But of course you could film in 4K and just extract 8 megapixel stills from that, but I'd prefer to have 17 megapixel stills. Sure. Why not? The, the, the pixels are there. So... I think we've done a pretty good job with this, but I, I happen to know that there are a couple of more issues, uh, of things that are missing from this camera, things that you wish it had. And one thing that it does have, I know, which has become a must have for me, even more so than touch screens, is this USB recharge. Uh, especially for a camera like this, because this is not my primary camera. This is a camera that I take um, as a second camera when I'm out shooting. Uh, unless I'm just going out to dinner because I can put it in my pocket. But I've got to have the ability to recharge it through the USB port. I don't want to travel and take a battery charger, which is almost the size of the camera. Uh, so anyway, that's a nice feature. But what's missing? What else is missing that we haven't mentioned here? Okay, well, as we know, as you mentioned, you can you can charge the camera over USB. It's worth noting that something unique that Sony does that the other manufacturers don't do is you can power the camera over USB as well. Most of the other cameras, as soon as you plug in a USB power source, it says, well, I can either charge or I can ignore it. I can't do, I can't run off that power. If you want to switch me on and start taking pictures or playing stuff back, I'm going to ignore that power source. Whereas the Sony's let you actually power the cameras over USB as well. So that's a really nice bonus. What I'd really like to see, and this is a, a criticism, not just against Sony, this is for everyone. It's open to all of you camera manufacturers out there. These cameras are perfect for video logging, um, video blogging. I should stop calling it video logging, vlogging. Um, you know, and, and the Mark V is even better because it's got the face detect AF. It's going to track your face brilliantly. The 4K video is great quality. What about the audio? None of these cameras have got microphone inputs or any means by which to connect a high quality microphone. To me, that is such a missed opportunity. Maybe there's no room for a three and a half mil jack, in which case, look, I'm using a USB microphone now. Is it not possible to plug a USB microphone into the USB port? Maybe it's a software thing. I don't know. Maybe it needs a new USB controller. I don't know. But surely you could do that. Or, you know, these things are packed with wireless capabilities. Maybe there's some opportunity to have a Wi-Fi microphone or a Bluetooth microphone if it has a Bluetooth radio in there. I just think there's a real opportunity for Canon or Panasonic or Sony or Nikon or anyone else who makes these cameras to, to produce the no-brainer for, for vloggers here, you know, or anyone who just wants, you know, decent quality audio. Mm -hmm. While I'm talking about wireless, I'd like to also note that while the RX100 Mark V is of a similar age kind of generation to the A6500, it does not have the Bluetooth that that camera has. Now, the A6500 uses Bluetooth to maintain a low power link with your smartphone to pull off GPS position and, and embed them without you having to do anything. It works brilliantly. The RX100 Mark V, unfortunately, doesn't have that. And so you're relying on this ridiculously convoluted process if you want high resolution location tagged images what you need to do first of all, <laughs> what you need to do is first of all remote control the camera with your phone but wait a minute uh, if you've just unpacked this camera then you'll notice that the uh, remote control doesn't have the features that you want so the first thing you need to do is actually connect this camera to the internet and curse Sony's lack of touchscreen as you enter in all your passwords and URLs and everything, eventually connect it to the Play Memory service and update the Smart Remote app. You have to do it with all Sony cameras. I keep banging on about it because it is such a pain in the neck. Once you've updated that, suddenly you've got manual exposure control and the ability to actually tap uh, focus on your phone, although not when it's recording video, only for stills. I don't know why. Why do they do that? But now, while you're remote controlling the camera, if you have location 
information turned on, on on the Play Memories app. If you take a photo, now this only works when you're remote controlling the camera with your phone. So you have to kind of hold the camera with one hand and the phone with the other or have it on a tripod. You take the photo. Now that photo, which is inside your phone, is location tagged. Now there's also one that's inside the camera that won't be location tagged. So you just think, that's okay, I'll ignore that when I have the other one. But here's the rub. If you've not set in another menu, in another Play Memories menu that you want the original resolution, then what you'll have is an original resolution file that's not tagged with the location in the camera and a low resolution file in the camera that is tagged, but it's low res. But if you set it to original in the app on the, on the phone, again, I'm using my hand phone. Do you like that? I, I seem to be doing this all the time. If you're listening to this as a podcast, do go over to YouTube and see me use my hand phone. It, 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 looks, like, it looks like the Queen's Wave. It is. It is. Hello. How are you? You're one of my people. Very jolly good to see you. Um, so once you, so if you've got well, so if you've got location services turned on and you've got a send original image turned on and you don't mind triggering the shutter by remote control using your phone, then and only then will you end up with a high res image with the location coordinates. But again, it's not in the camera, it's in the phone. So then you have to copy it into, say, Dropbox on your phone to get it onto your computer and and then bingo you've got your photo tagged as desired so please sony put bluetooth in the next one or at least put some sort of location logging facility in the play memories uh, app because otherwise you know i mean i do moan about having to update this app but it does work very well once you updated it because the thing i love about the sony cameras if you have a picture playing back on the screen and you've got a um a phone or a smart hand like me with nfc built in then all you have to do is hold it next to it and it will it goes well he's playing a picture so i know he wants to send it to the phone it'll just send it across i don't need to press any buttons to confirm it everyone else says at least do you want to send it not certainly i'm just going to send it i'm going to assume that's what you want and it's always correct or if i'm shooting with the camera so it's in live view and i hold the uh, the smart hand against it then it knows that i want to remote control it so you know sony's dead smart about this it's so that you know in some aspects it's wi-fi is brilliant in others it's insanely infuriating well, of course, uh, those of us who are Apple users don't get the advantage of the NFC. So that's that's a, that's another story. That's a story for another show. But um, I think you've convinced me that I don't want to do this. Uh, I, I would get bet that the majority of our listeners and viewers out there who have these cameras never install one of the installable apps through Play Memories. Uh, I did when I first got the cameras, but you know, I had the... Mark II, I sold it, I got the Mark III, I sold it, I got the Mark IV. Um, I've never bothered to install an app. Um, it, it's just too painful. It really is too painful. I know, okay. and I think maybe, you know, because everyone else is, yeah, it expands the capabilities, it gives it better time, that's capable. Everyone else has that built in. And I think because it's so convoluted installing this software and updating it and all the rest of it, I just, just, I think they should dump the, the, the app system. I used to think it was a good thing, and, but now increasingly I think maybe they should just have a rethink about this and just integrate it into the operating system. And if it transpires that the only reason behind it was to basically gather email addresses and information, then just do an offer to people and just say, look, here's $5. Give me your email address. I promise not to spam you. And people go, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Um, and, you know, then we can forget about the apps and just move on. I mean, what I wanted to ask you, Doug, though, is while I was comparing this camera to things like the Lumix and the Canon, the question of the lens kept coming up to me. Do you think this camera now on its third generation with the same lens, do you think that lens, because you're familiar with it on the Mark IV, mm -hmm. does it need changing in some way? Would you like it to be longer, focus closer, brighter, wider, or is it everything you want? Well, I've had the same comment for the last three versions of this camera, which is for me, the lens is great because this is my equivalent of a 24 to 70 in my pocket. Uh, that's literally what it is. I will often go out with just a, a camera that has a fixed 35 or 28 millimeter lens as my number one camera. And my second camera has a 24 to 70, which is a standard mid range zoom. So, since I've never owned the G7X or the LX10-15, I can't compare apples to apples, but this does the job for me. But I, I understand that it's somewhat dated. This has been the same lens for quite some time. I find it quite good. Mm, um, 
I mean, comparing it to the other to the other uh, one inch com- cameras that we've been talking about. I mean, first of all, so if you've got to decide between, say, the Mark Four and the Mark Five, the Mark Five, what it offers you over the Mark Four is that front side LSI that allows you to shoot at twenty four frames per second, doubles the high frame rate recording time. It's got the embedded face detect AF and those massive bursts. If you don't need any of that, get the Mark Four. If now, what the difference between the Mark IV and the Mark III is uh, the high frame rate video modes, albeit at the shorter length, and 4K video. If you don't need those, then get the Mark III because really they are very, very similar cameras. And, and the really important thing that you keep coming back to with these three cameras is that built-in electronic viewfinder. And this is the killer feature that it has over most of the competition. The, you know, uh, Panasonic will get you a built-in viewfinder on the TZ100, ZS100, which is a 10 times zoom, but it's a slightly different class of camera. So I really think that, I mean, Canon will also give you a viewfinder if you've got the longer zoom one or the, or the bigger one, the much bigger one that looks like a mini DSLR. It's a nice camera, but it's it's not a pocket camera. So Sony's got this kind of, you still got this unique proposition where it's got the fairly bright lens and the built-in viewfinder in a body that's really small. But again, you don't need the Mark V or even the Mark IV to get that. You can get that with the Mark III. And then when you're at the Mark III price, you think, well, you know, I'm similar in price to, say, the LX10, LX15 which doesn't have a built-in viewfinder, but it does have 4K video and a touchscreen. And it has all of those cool uh, 4K photo things. Or you can get the Canon G7X Mark II. Now, that doesn't have a built-in viewfinder either, and it doesn't do 4K, but it does have a nicer grip, and it has the touchscreen. And um, Canon's JPEGs are really nice, I find. Uh, Out of the three brands that I've talked about, the output from the in-camera JPEGs I prefer from the Canon and that longer zoom. And I've got comparisons, you know, at camelabs.com between between them, you know, just between 70 mil 2.8 and 100 mil 2.8. Well, 100 mil, now you're never going to get a very shallow depth of field at a portrait distance on these cameras because it's still a small sensor. But what you will do at 100 mil equivalent field of view is you'll be much tighter on the background. The background, there'll be much less of it. So it's much less distracting than it is at 70 mil. Uh, which again makes it easy to frame up. You know, when you're doing a portrait and the person's looking great and you look in the background, you're like, oh no, there's a, you know, there's something over there I don't want. It's quite easy at longer focal lengths to just nudge it to the side and it's gone. But when you're shooting at shorter focal lengths, it's harder. It's harder to get those distracting things out of the way. So lots to weigh up, but I've got loads of comparisons of features and quality. And do look at the, you know, the close up comparison I did with the LX10, LX15 as well, because you'll see that the rendering is really different on the Panasonic and you may prefer it a lot, especially the closer focusing distance. So one last thing I wanted to ask you about with this camera, actually the, the one of the best features is that it's small enough that it fits in a pocket. At least it fits in my pants pocket. It's the limit. It, you can't get one that's any larger. So how does this camera compare size-wise to the Canon G7X and the Lumix LX10-15? Well, they're all about the same size. If you're after something that's smaller, only Canon has one with a one-inch sensor, and that's the PowerShot G9X. Really small, has the one-inch sensor, but it has a slower lens. So some of the benefit of having that bigger sensor are lost, and the screen doesn't articulate. But it is it is little, and it is cute. Very much like myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and on that bottom what a, shell. <laughs> what, a, what a perfect point to end our review. Um, this has been great, Gordon. I think... Uh, Fifth generation. Amazing. Well, I wonder if there will be an RX100 Mark VI. It's also worth noting, though, that at the time we're recording this review, Sony still offers the Mark III, the Mark IV, and the Mark V as brand new cameras. That's unusual. They, you know, normally they will discontinue the previous models, but here they have all three versions available. And the one last thing I'd say about that is do check if you're considering the four versus the five. Check the price because the price difference may, may, be, may be negligible. So you may be just as well off with the five. Um, this has been great. Uh, everyone, I want to thank you for watching and, and listening to our review. Point out that you can hear, oh, sorry, point out that you can read much more about this camera over at cameralabs.com. 
Uh, Gordon's exhaustive reviews, you can see many, many sample images. Uh, the videos that we've shown you here, uh, or if you've only listened to the audio version of the podcast, go over to cameralabs.com and, uh, and look at the videos there. The examples are very valuable. Uh, also, if you're interested in purchasing any of the cameras we've mentioned on this show or any other shows, please go over to cameralabs.com and click on the purchase links. It, it helps us put food on the table. And even more importantly, buy us a cup of coffee. It's a, a great way to help support the show. And it, if anything, we absolutely need it. When we do these shows, it's early morning for me and I'm desperate. Gordon's all amped up and, and had enough coffee for the day, but um, help us out. Buy us a cup of coffee. Yeah, I should say also that if you're watching on YouTube, we've got a link for the uh, coffee donation in the description underneath. And you'll also see a link to the new Camera Labs merchandise store. Yes, it's the type, it's the part of the show where we all try and sell you stuff. The T-shirts that if you watch the videos that you see uh, me wear are now available. I've got another one here. If you're listening, you won't know what I'm talking about, but they look fabulous. So if you're interested in the Camera Labs T-shirt or buying us a coffee, then that's how you support our work going forward. And if you want to go shooting with Doug, go to DougK.com and check out his schedule for future workshops because those are really, really worthwhile if you want to get become a much better street photographer or just hang out with one of the nicest guys online or in real life and uh, yeah we're going back to cuba all the time if uh, it's a great time to go to cuba and i encourage you to go to as gordon says go to dougk.com and look for my workshops there gordon a great review thank you once again and we'll see you next time on the camera labs photography podcast bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.